together in collaboration that we've been we've been working together for um, about three or four years now under the moniker of SSG or Site Seal Gesture. Um, we're both artists uh, and we come from a background in architecture and we're now like Lee is an archaeologist, I'm a geographer. Uh, but this this project we're predominantly working together as artists and um, using our, our academic practices to inform that. Uh, we, we work on the southeast coast in of England. Uh, we we do stuff in the along the Thames estuary in the, the Medway. Um, we look at abandoned uh, defensive architectures uh, and like, forts and bunkers and sound mirrors. Um, and also work in South West China, looking at um, rock cut burial sites. And th these two, uh, my, my, my uh, research has been about marginal sites in, in uh, East London. Lear's work is, is um, rock cut burial sites in South West China. So we, we're kind of bringing them together our two uh, respective sort of academic field work practices. Um, and reinterpreting it through our creative practice. Um, so we, yeah, we, we, we foreground our, our artistic practice within this um, and use it as a way to sort of rethink our own fieldwork practices and to think about the nature of collaboration. Um, and as, as, as a sort of mechanism or a way of discussing between each other um, our own disciplinary backgrounds. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we, we presented this work in a number of different contexts um, in archi architecture, um, in archaeology conferences, in uh, urbanism contexts. And we, we, we're sort of constantly shifting the, the, the way we contextualise it and the way we think about it. So, so we kind of like we, we've talked about the, some of this material a number of times before, and, uh, and th this this time I'm going to try and talk about it in a different way because uh, I know a few people might have heard it before. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk specifically about um, the who who fought in the Medway, uh, which is uh, southeast coast. It's, um, the, it's it's a river that feeds into the Thames estuary. And we're going to we, we, we're sort of thinking about or exploring ideas of dissonance between uh, physical and historical evidence, and exploring methods for uh, constructing non-linear narratives that link together materiality, a landscape, and ourselves as collaborators. Uh, more broadly speaking, our, our landscapes are marginal; they're often abandoned or um, inaccessible or difficult to access. Uh, we, we kind of think of this as uh, like heritage without value. Um, or in the case of uh, the, the rock cut burial sites in, in China, they're the, the product of a um, kind of nomadic cultures that purposefully kind of avoided centers. So the, the example, Is, is Hu Fort, which is a Napoleonic fort uh, in the Medway. Uh, it's, it's only really accessible or easily accessible during high tide. Um, it's, it's set in a, it's on, a, it's on an island, it's um, quite marshy land. Um, the, the actual fort itself is <coughs> surrounded by a moat and it's accessible by a, a ladder that somebody's left like to, some previous visitors have, have put there um, and we accessed it well we, we, we got a canoe and, and just kind of went across the river um, and stayed there for, tw for uh, 48 hours overnight um, and we kind of arrived at the fort at night it's on two layers uh, the, the bottom layer is flooded, the top layer is um, a series of alcoves, 11 alcoves, and it has this um, 
sort of feeling of a kind of recursive interiority because it's, it's very it's difficult to access. So uh, you, you, you constantly um, going through a series of boundaries and barriers to get to it, and then then once you're on it, and the tide goes out. Then you're, you're kind of trapped there, essentially, um, surrounded by a kind of a sea of mud, really, once, once the tide's gone out. So, we, so we have this sort of sense of, of, of a, a linear movement, um, transgressing, you know, sort of dealing with all these sort of boundaries, and then, and then once you're in the fort, um, it becomes this very linear movement around the fort, um, which is actually quite disorientating. Um, we might have a video of a look in the video. Um, is that? No. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we have this sort of a uh, circular movement of the fort and, and this a series of radial views inside and outside so it kind of feels like a, um, a, a panopticon um, towards the centre of the fort and towards the outside of, of the fort as well. Um, <coughs> So we have these kind of like series of momentary glimpses. Um, it's kind of like a collection of, 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 of momentary glimpses really through, through these windows. So we were, we were thinking about how to, how to think about this as a non, a way of constructing non-linear narratives. Um, and we were, we've been sort of think, talking about, between ourselves about combinatory uh, systems for structuring narrative. Um, we, we were looking at um, Calvino's Castle of Cross Destinies, which is a, a book which is structured uh, through the through tarot cards. Um, so he, he, using the, using this kind of combinatory system, he structures the whole text and the relationships and the histories between the people and the characters and the, the, the places in the text. Um, we've also been looking at the I Ching. Which is similarly a, a combinatory system, um, and thinking about how we can use these things as a as a kind of game. Really, you know, we, we're not we don't sort of take it um, as a, a, a divination system. We just take it as a device for structuring uh, a narrative and making links between landscape, materiality, and subject, and. And kind of keeping this open open endedness as well, which is a, which is a, a very central feature to our collaboration. So one of the uh, one of the sort of things about using these these kind of ways of structuring um, our narratives is they, they they bring ideas of chance and encounter with places and objects and ideas, um, and making speculative leaps and relationships between people, places, um, and, put, and put the idea of precariousness sort of central to uh, our practice. And it, it also, we also pick up on some ideas like the paranoid critical method, which is a kind of surrealist um, device, which takes small details and makes them, uh, gives them significance. Um, where they don't really have significance, so we so we kind of work on this process of, of giving significance to insignificant details, um, which which marries very closely to the marginal landscapes we look at because we're trying to give significance to these uh, margins. So we use so we're using the tower as a tool for exploring these ideas and uh, as a way of collecting. We collect objects and we put them in. The various um, in, in the Who Fort, we, we kind of collected objects and put them in each of the alcoves and kind of used use this as a as a mechanism for discussing all the sites that we've visited there at this site and previous sites between us. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over. Okay. Yeah. Um, so 
So I, I continue the slide reading. It's not card readings, but it's slide reading today. And I continue with this object. Uh, so it's a third century um, architectural model of a Buddhist uh, stupa. And uh, if you look at the upper register, you have um, these figures under arcades. These are uh, Buddhist images. And what you have on the lower register are um, other deities from the Buddhist pantheon that are tried to be matched with uh, the I Ching, so eight hexagrams. So the, the base of the object is octagonal, and the top of it is circular. And this, um, this is an attempt to combine the pre-existing uh, combinatory system that existed, well, a system of belief that existed in China with an incoming faith. So it's really an object that functions as a translator and uh, as a key uh, between two systems. And uh, it very much inspired our, uh, our discussion in, in Hu. So um, apart from this interest in uh, combination and translation, we are also interested in the connection between material and textual evidence or the dissonance between the two, as Rupert uh, mentioned. So, and as this is an, a conference called, well, historical archeology, span we really want to talk about the connection between uh, sign and matter, how to translate one to another and how to solve uh, what is uh, often a divorce between the two. So this is, um, a replica of a second century AD uh, rock cut burial. It's an unfinished one. And we did that last May, or was it a year and a half ago? Yeah. And um, yeah, so Rupert visited me on, on field work, and I, I tried to um, <coughs> collect unfinished examples of these caves and reconstruct this tradition over the landscape. But this was just one, uh, one experiment. And uh, what interests us now is the connection between this uh, door so this recessed door, uh, an element that we find both in bunkers and in these burials. Interesting, it, interestingly, in bunkers, uh, it's supposed to avoid uh, ricochet, ricocheting um, uh, bullets. Well, uh, in the case of the burials, it's, uh, it's to enhance the visibility of, of, uh, of, the, of the door and the threshold. So the inscription uh, next to it, uh, that's what we're going to look at now, uh, was carved by the same two stone masons, uh, actually stone warriors, uh, that uh, help us in the experiment. Uh, the masons were illiterate, so I had to write uh, the, the content of the inscription uh, big enough on a piece of paper and hand it to them, and I had to check really, uh, at almost every stroke to be able to uh, write that. The content of the inscription is uh, pretty much uh, along the lines of second century uh, uh, inscriptions that are attached to the caves usually. So it just uh, mentions the date um, and uh, what this is, uh, who built it, and uh, how much time it took, and uh, how much money was invested in the building of the cave, and who were the masons. So the mason uh, was actually able to write his own name as the last character, and that was the most readable, and let's say, well, uh, well-written character of them all. Uh, it, as compared to the second century AD inscriptions, they're very, very similar. So it's not uh, classical uh, epigraphy of the time. It's, uh, it's well, it, you know, you can't read Chinese characters, but you can notice that the, these three signs are similar. And these are three attempts to actually start the inscription. And then he forgot a word here, and he put it next to it. And then he kind of completes two words here. And the Masons uh, did exactly the same kind of uh, uh, adaptations to the text I handed them. So on the left hand side you have a robin, and on the right hand side it's the inscription itself. And uh, now we go back to this idea of commentary and uh, translation uh, exchange between uh, textual realities and material ones. So here you have the word um, that could not resist and use the stone mason tool to add a sightseeing gesture graffiti next to my second century replica. 
and, uh, and that's really interesting because uh, epigraphy and calligraphy function in the landscape always in this accumulative way. Uh, so on the right hand side you have a typical landscape painting with a successful succeeding commentaries succeeding each other over time, over uh, several centuries, and the seals with red stamps that uh, mark ownership or just the event of viewing uh, the painting. And the association between um, landscape painting, calligraphy, and uh, seal carving is really what I try to contribute to our project uh, in terms of artistic practice. So Rupert has mentioned that we both have a background in architecture and in a way, uh, this triad between uh, landscape, seal carving, and calligraphy is an homologous, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an echo of the role uh, architecture holds um, in, in the arts uh, of, uh, of Occident. So that's just the last inscription that we added to um, to the second of the experiments, it was a second uh, two cubic meter scale. Uh, on the right hand side is the stone mason, and uh, here we plot a little tree since we already replicate uh, a second century AD Indo-Turks <coughs> as well, right on the street now. And uh, also the content of the inscription is a little poor poem, simply placing <coughs> uh, our experiments in the line of uh, of um, a series of interpretation. <coughs> Uh, produced by um, by the by the, the, the inhabitants of these areas that uh, see these caves every day, but also by um, viewers of the cave um, through history. So they have been interpreted as dwellings or uh, dwellings of Aboriginal or wild people as well as dwelling of emerging beings. So, um, that's the same uh, commentary viewed from, from the cable car, because it was at the top of the mountain. And um, it's really uh, good that we had this, uh, this uh, text before on the impression of being seen, because when you look at the landscape from the cave, uh, we will have all these very um, interesting views and very wide views, and we always uh, feel that um, the views in which uh, this, um, the view sheds in which the, the, the caves, the rock and caves are the coat, are comparable to the ones uh, uh, in which the bunkers are coat. And to finish, um, well, this is just an example of uh, a rough cut burial <coughs> cemetery down here, uh, in, now reached by urbanization. Usually, they're in uh, faraway uh, highland landscapes. Uh, they dot really the whole landscape of this imperial frontier. And I just showed this because um, that's the, the extent of my research, and the burials really map this uh, highland area. And uh, as the history has left no record of its population, that's pretty much the only way we can uh, map their presence. For from highlands back to islands, this is just an image of the estuary uh, and all the sites we've been surveying. And always uh, trying to uh, go back and forth between uh, field work and the studio, uh, using landscape seals as, as many islands or monuments. Um, as a last slide, I think I can show uh, this, which is the last thing we've been doing together. That's a fragment of the recess door we've seen earlier on. Uh, it's carved in the trope of, uh, of broad stairs. Uh, so that's the white cliffs of Dover's, and they keep eroding over time, so you have material for three, very soft, easy to carve, and then you have also the pleasure of seeing it eroding over time. So, uh, we, we just uh, keep trying to tune up uh, these bunker sites and uh, rock and burial sites 
by um, picking up elements, uh, adding them to our language, scaling down, scaling up, fragmenting, etc. I think you've said it all. Um,